As emergency managers know from hard-earned experience, it is far too late to begin planning their response once a critical incident has taken place. Successful disaster preparedness begins months or even years in advance with detailed plans of action, clear communication, and collaboration protocols with the response community. Disaster plans should also include written agreements with private sector technology companies who can be called upon to provide specific tools and subject matter expertise to aid in the response effort. Today on Mission Critical, we will explore the use of technology in emergency management. We will look at opportunities to employ new technology, analyze information technology standards, and evaluate technology in the crisis and response environment. And we will also discuss structuring meaningful private sector relationships that result in greater integrity of the national critical infrastructure. It's increasingly more important for emergency managers to continue keeping themselves abreast of new technology solutions that will genuinely improve their operational competencies. These are the points of discussion on this edition of Mission Critical. Yeah, we have, we've got a tornado. Tornadoes. A tornado struck before dawn in Alabama today. A monster earthquake. Earthquakes. earthquakes. That is completely correct. Evacuation is taking place right now because of the threat of levee breaks. Levee breaks. A catastrophic failure. Station of damage for uh, half the county, 130,000 acres. An out of control brush fire in the Reno, Nevada Monsters area. Monstrous flames that tore through slave lakes. Wildfires. Nearly five square miles were scorched in just a matter of hours. Advising you to evacuate your house. Nine people killed, and there are still 20 missing. The site of that devastating bridge collapse. Infrastructure failures. Terrorism. Nine deaths across three states, including tragically two young children. An unexpected turn from a hurricane. It's just been hours and hours and hours of Currently uh, in the southeast Bahamas, now a category uh, three hurricane. Disasters can occur at any time without warning. Each one with unexpected impacts on operational protocols. Each disaster can have a profound impact on the lives, property, and economy reaching far beyond the localized affected area. When they started talking about how serious the storm was and, and how intense it was going to be when it hit Richmond, I was very concerned about my family, my home, and my community. The images that my children have of that storm, I didn't want them to go through that again, so I had a plan to send them out west. With the hurricane, the primary um, hazard is coastal flooding, storm surge. That has a potential for not only uh, loss of life, but tremendous destruction. The damage was significant. There were trees down. We had power out for several days. Uh, it was hard to get food. It was hard to get water. It was hard to get gas. American emergency managers are tasked with the important responsibility of protecting millions of people through effective disaster planning. The primary mission of the State Emergency Operations Center is to coordinate response to a disaster or an emergency. In order to do that, we have to have plans and procedures in place. We have to have the resources to enable that response. Uh, and that's where technology plays such an important role. Disaster plans also require communicating with the public to ensure each citizen participates in the preparedness plans and evacuation orders. This was a challenging responsibility before Oklahoma City, before September 11th, before Hurricane Katrina, and before the economic downturn. Our budget constraints have uh, affected us uh, dramatically. Uh, these technologies and these emerging trends are very expensive. Uh, that is why public-private partnerships are something that we 
as emergency managers, as fusion center directors, as uh, elected officials should look at leveraging. In today's operational environment, we rely heavily on older but proven technologies. And we have liftoff, liftoff of a Delta II rocket carrying GOI-1, the world's highest resolution commercial Earth imaging satellite. But today's private sector technologies can assist emergency managers on many levels. From our experience, uh, the majority of the new programs we're using uh, are coming from the private sector. So that link to those private sector partners is becoming more and more important every day. I think the private sector has the speed and agility that's necessary to be very responsive to situations like this. The government is particularly good at some things, but the ability to make decisions rapidly is not something that they're necessarily known for. And I think the public-private partnerships can be particularly helpful in this area. It's very important to stay up on technology. If, if you don't, you're, you're going to be run over by it. It's not just the forecasting models that the Weather Service and those folks are doing for us. Uh, it's getting the Twitter feeds, uh, pulling up information, real-time information about what's going on, and of course, it's the new technologies that enable us to do that. Are you keeping up with new technology? Hello, I'm Dr. John Sullivan, and this is Mission Critical TV educational and accredited content for first responders, emergency managers, healthcare, government, and defense personnel. Mission Critical TV is made possible today through an educational grant from Capella University. Capella is an accredited online university. Learn more about Capella's degree offerings in the School of Public Service Leadership by visiting capella.edu forward slash public service. Just as a reminder to our viewers, Capella University will have an archive of this program. And for those interested in receiving professional educational credits, you will need to log on to the Capella University site at capella.edu forward slash mission critical. At this Capella website, you can watch this episode again and register to earn professional credits. Although our program is taped, our viewers can still be a part of our discussion by emailing us and we will have your questions answered by our panel of experts. You can send your questions to questions at missioncriticaltv.com and keep up with all of our training programs on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash missioncriticaltv. I'd like to begin by introducing our guest. First, we have Mr. Stephen King. Mr. King is the Division Director for the Contingency Planning and Emergency Management Division in the Office of Infrastructure Protection at DHS Headquarters. Mr. King is also a firefighter EMT paramedic at Stonewall Jackson Volunteer Fire Department. And then we have Captain Steve Lambert, the Division Commander for the Virginia State Police Criminal Intelligence Division, which houses the Virginia Fusion Center, a multidisciplined information and intelligence center dedicated to fighting crime and terrorism. I know from my experience that, that a constant topic at GovSec conferences has always been communications interoperability and having uniform standards. Where are we in the process with that, Steve? Well, I see this as really two separate issues. One is the sort of the IT platforms and the, the, the technological side of this, being able to communicate, uh, being able to um, share the same radio frequencies, that sort of thing. A separate issue, but equally important, in my opinion, is the role of sort of understanding the, the same terminology, speaking the same language, and being on the same game plan. Uh, when it comes to responding and response efforts, I think these are two equally important uh, aspects. As we all know, uh, interoperability also involves sharing data. Steve, from your perspective, do all the differing IT platforms that are out there pose any specific challenges to DHS? Well, you're exactly right. There are a lot of different IT platforms out there and a lot of different IT systems. Um, so for example, when it comes to the uh, now 76 major uh, state and major urban area fusion centers that are around the country, um, every fusion center, many of the different fusion centers use different technology. So when it comes to how do we share suspicious activity reports across all of the fusion centers and the federal government, uh, this can pose a, a real challenge. So we've approached it 
uh, not as a, a build this system and they will come sort of approach mm -hmm. and then ask people to get on board with a, a new system, but instead uh, to say, tell us what system you're using and we'll provide the, the, the technological help to better communicate those suspicious activity reports to other fusion centers around the country. Um, it's a piece of software called the ETL, uh, Extract, Transform, and Load. So if a fusion center is using a particular piece of software to store their suspicious activity reports, we'll come in, insert that piece of software, and allow them to expose that data to the rest of the community. Uh, but we have to do that for every single fusion center or for many different fusion centers. Uh, fortunately, some of them use similar software programs, so we don't have to necessarily write 76 different pieces of software, but we do have to write several, and having that interoperability is a, is a challenge. It, one of the challenges must be logistics, too, in terms of when DHS is taking this tailoring approach, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, what does that do to logistics in terms of planning and, and actually executing? That's right. It, it requires us to follow through to create a, pa a, a, a plan for how we're going to approach all of the different uh, fusion centers, major law enforcement agencies, and federal agencies and departments as well, and prioritize. Uh, which ones do we reach out to first? Which ones do we actually fly out and provide uh, a piece of hardware and all that software that's needed? And which ones are more interested in jumping on board in terms of uh, using a, a web portal or something like that that they can do uh, fairly quickly. Right. Uh, so logistics is a big issue with us. Captain Lambert, um, in your position at the Fusion Center, you must be dealing with a host of differing mobile applications, uh, central databases, RMS, record management systems, et cetera. How do you fuse all that information for all of the various applications that are out there? One of the unique attributes of a Fusion Center is, uh, especially when you're dealing with, with in information intelligence, most intelligence agencies derived and verified all of their information internal. The Fusion Center takes all, all comers, so all sources of information, from public, from private, from uh, obviously uh, state and local and federal government. So it is uh, a very large undertaking. Uh, what we do, however, is what uh, Steve had mentioned earlier. Uh, we are very fond of allowing folks to continue to have the way of sharing information and we find a way to integrate that into our workflow and, and management process of the data as we uh, take what is relevant, verify it, and send it out to the stakeholders that are obviously decision makers and we need to be sharing information with. It's a, uh, with the continual uh, evolution and flux that is the threat environment that we're dealing with, it right. is a it's something that is ever evolving and we're always having to look at new technology and new manners of uh, conducting business and uh, it's, it's going to always be that way, I believe. Seems like a monumental task as technology changes. It, it is. I, I will say though that there are some efforts here to standardize where possible. So for example, when it comes to the sharing of information, the Department of Justice created a uh, something called the NEEM, the National Information Exchange Model. And it's really a standard for how IT systems can communicate information uh, across very different platforms. Yes. Uh, there are other standards out there, and I think what we're really looking forward to is the, uh, a future where some of these standards really take hold and people say, yes, I'm going to jump on board, for example, the uh, NFPA is 1600 when it comes to business continuity and disaster response efforts, those sorts of things. I see. Steve, what are some of the newest technologies being employed in, in emergency management out there today? Well, GIS, geospatial uh, information systems or geographic information systems are uh, really taking hold. Um, on the operational level, I'm seeing a lot more technology or, and ideas uh, cropping up out of research and development centers around the country for um, Augmented reality, I mean, this is one that I'm particularly excited about. I would love to see in the future um, SCBAs, the self-contained breathing apparatus, mass, tell me more through a heads-up display than just my air level. I would love for them to integrate uh, thermal imaging cameras. I'd love for them to integrate a floor plan so when I'm in a smoke-filled room, I can actually see uh, where the doors are or at least where they were when the 
uh, building was last inspected or constructed, um, but to provide a lot more information. And augmented reality, I think, holds a, a lot of promise for the future. Uh, an example of augmented reality that we can all relate to is uh, nowadays when you watch a football game, you see uh, that, that yellow line on the field or right. red line on the field. Absolutely. Obviously, it's not there if you're there, but <laughs> it sure helps me at home uh, when I get to watch this on television. Same thing, where I can augment the reality in front of me with, uh, with enhanced electronics. Do you see this really changing the whole face of the mobility aspect of technology? Well, I, and I think that's really the future. Uh, mobile applications, mobile devices uh, are the wave of the future. Uh, for example, when it comes to uh, the fire service uh, and trying to, to minimize the line of duty deaths, uh, some of the technological advances that uh, are being discussed now are uh, uh, embedded in your, your firefighter's gear. Uh, you would have an RFID, radio frequency identification uh, chip, that would help identify where firefighters are within the building at any given moment so the incident commander can see that. And that's a, that's a great mobile technology, if you will. Sure. Uh, and there are there are plenty of others, and I think this is really the wave of the future. Terrific, Captain Lambert. I know a lot of agencies are starting to look at social media. Does your agency uh, use social media in any way? And if so, could you explain it? Yes, and um, in the Fusion Center, we certainly do. Obviously, it's how people communicate, and you can never underestimate or ignore the fact that that's how people do business and that's how people communicate so it is now a just a common staple of any workup that we do on a lead or uh, a criminal investigative uh, support so we certainly uh, are we certainly uh, are looking for better ways to uh, use that data to help the investigators and to help uh, recontrol a situation if you will or take back control of a situation as we've seen some uh, unrest and so forth that usually evolves around um, uh, social media. Uh, social media is also something that the agency and the Virginia Fusion Center is trying to reach out and help them to understand more about how we can work together to solve those problems. Uh, it's, it's been difficult because uh, uh, it, it's sometimes politically charged and, and we have to deal with those uh, types of emails and those types of situations or those types of uh, tweets or Facebook posts or that type of thing. But uh, it is definitely something that we will be using uh, from here on out, some fashion of social media. Yeah, and I'll just say that within the Department of Homeland Security, there's been really tremendous support for the use of social media. One example would be uh, the administrator of FEMA, uh, Craig Fugate, uh, has a Twitter account. Folks can follow him on, on Twitter. Uh, the former uh, commandant of the United States Coast Guard, uh, Admiral Thad Allen, uh, had a fantastic YouTube video actually years ago really suggesting to his officers uh, that social media, as the captain said, is the wave of the future, that this is how our citizens and our, our, our people communicate with us, and we need to embrace it. I, I will, if I could, I found a, a really fascinating mobile application uh, by a, a fire department in Northern California, uh, which really I think this is talks about, is a great example of Web 2.0. Uh, Web 2.0 being instead of content uh, created by, by, by large organizations or, or the, the folks who own the site, uh, but instead the new world that we live in now where content on the World Wide Web is really created by many of the users. Uh, in, in this case, it's a mobile app called Fire Department, and uh, if you were to download the app onto your phone and say, yes, I, I have CPR training, um, and I'd be willing to help someone if they were to go into cardiac arrest, that mobile app will uh, identify your location, and um, if there is a call for someone having a, a heart attack um, and you're within a, a short distance of there, it will notify you so you could uh, conceivably walk out of the, uh, the the department store you're in and and walk to the restaurant next door and and provide CPR uh, very quickly. Uh, I think these kinds of innovations are are fantastic and I think we're going to see a lot more of them in the future. What about data warehousing? It, it, the topic always comes up because we're we're dealing with greater and greater quantities of digital information. So where where do we store it? What about data warehousing? Does that pose an issue from a 
the national DHS level? Well, I've certainly been responsible for projects that uh, incorporated uh, significant data warehousing efforts, and I'm actually pretty excited about this current project, uh, the Nationwide Suspicious Activity Reporting Initiative, where we're not so much creating a giant data warehouse to store all of these suspicious activity reports. Instead, we're moving to something called federated searching, and this allows us to uh, have tiny stores of information or smaller stores of, of, uh, of information, uh, really smaller data marts, if you will, within each of the fusion centers, uh, major law enforcement agencies, uh, and some of the federal departments. Uh, and those smaller data marts actually just expose the data uh, to the rest of the sort of federated search environment, this virtual database, if you will. So if you're a user and you want to look at all the suspicious activity reports uh, in the system, you type a search query and it comes back with results and you would assume that you're just pinging a single database. But in reality, uh, in the background, your system is checking multiple smaller data marts around the country. The advantages to this are pretty significant, more than just saving on you know, storage space somewhere in a data center. Right. Uh, it's really control over the information. So if Captain Lambert has a su suspicious activity report um, that he wants to share with others, that's easy enough. But what if he wants to remove that? Say his officers have conducted an investigation and realized, no, this person didn't, con uh, didn't do anything suspicious at all. This was perfectly harmless. I want to remove that from, the, from this federated search environment. Well, that's actually pretty easy because all he has to do is simply remove it from his system or block it from being shared with everyone else because there's no longer a value in that. That happens instantly. So as an analyst uh, in another state, uh, searches the database, this virtual database, uh, she doesn't actually see that SAR report the very next uh, minute after, after he removes it. So operational security is built right in then? Absolutely, and it's great for privacy concerns, civil liberties, civil rights, because I mean, no fusion center wants to provide information that's erroneous or spurious. Of course right. they want to have that removed and redacted as quickly as possible, and this allows that. Um, as well as being cost effective. And I think that's important too because uh, we're going to be collecting a lot more information just uh, as sensors become cheaper. I don't mean fusion centers. I just mean imp across, the, across the board. We're going to be collecting more and more information. Uh, storage space becomes cheaper as time goes on, but it's not, uh, that cost is never zero. So we've got to figure out ways to reduce costs and uh, in improve efficiencies. And I think federated searching does that as opposed to uh, the traditional data warehousing approach. As we transition with these new technologies, obviously those left behind are the legacy systems um, pose challenges. And, and do they affect our data networks and our communication center, uh, Captain Lambert? Uh, do you have issues, especially in a fusion center, I would imagine, dealing with multiple platforms and mm -hmm integrating existing protocols? How does that work? Yes, and, and law enforcement traditionally has been behind the curve on technology and upgrading systems. Uh, there are a number of legacy systems that, that are written in code that folks who are graduating college today have never heard right. of. So uh, it is it does present a challenge, but as the technology continues to advance, uh, particularly in the private sector, and and what we're taking advantage of and leveraging of in, in, pub, in, in government, uh, we're able to write interfaces so that we can truly have federated search capabilities. That data that's housed in the legacy system can be extracted and put in a NEEM compliant uh, uh, language that can auto-populate uh, other databases when we do checks, which, uh, by the way, you know, double entry into any uh, system, in other words, having to type the same information in two different systems is the death knell of morale in sure. dealing with these things. So uh, that type of technology, uh, the, 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 the old uh, legacy systems are slowly going away, but we're finding very creative ways in order to, uh, to, to actually check them now or to extract that data uh, as we continue to move forward. Technology is really changing the way we're doing business. It is. Steve, how, how does NIMS and ICS uh, contribute to overcoming the challenges that we face as we go forward into the next decade? Well, it really helps tremendously, especially in the area of sort of the cultural change that we talked about earlier. Right. How do we ensure operational consistency, for lack of a better term? How do we make sure that when 
firefighters, police officers, and emergency managers uh, are dealing with the same incident, that they're all working towards the same operational goals. And the incident command system and NIMS really provide a framework by which we can all operate together and work towards a common goal. We really learned a lot from the events of 9-11, and I know it changed ICS um, and how we deal with incident commands in the field. But um, as, we, as we go forward, uh, NIMS and ICS is become, becoming an increasingly more important aspect, as I understand absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely. Captain Lambert, from your aspect at the, at the state level, um, do your officers go through NIMS and ICS familiarization? It was actually mandated into law, uh, but even before that, at the state level, particularly my agency, we were, uh, there are different levels for different, obviously, roles within ICS and, and, and NIMS. So, yes, it, it is something that, um, that we have been involved in in a long time, that we continually are updated on the newest uh, best practices, if you will, uh, uh, you know, upgrades and training and upgrades and uh, as upgrades in how NIMS is carried out in particular situations as we learn more about the dynamics of situations. So it is here to stay, I believe, uh, for a long time. Learning more about new technology is what it's all about. Yes, sir. And we're going to talk more about the adoption of new technologies in a moment. But now would be a good time to take a look at our case study. Emergency response planning requires the participation from the entire community across jurisdictions. It encompasses multiple agencies and involves both public and private sectors. Next, we're going to look at the events surrounding Hurricane Irene and how the state of Virginia responded. I want to say a few words about Hurricane Irene, urge Americans to take it seriously, and provide an overview of our ongoing federal preparations for what's likely to be an extremely dangerous and costly storm. It looks like the track of Hurricane Irene is going to have a major impact along the East Coast, starting in the Carolinas all the way up through Maine. We were looking at potentially a worst case scenario. Preparations were um, rigorous and uh, this we were not taking this lightly. The public officials were being very good in terms of messaging the evacuation plans to the citizens, but again, there was a fair amount of variability in terms of how intense the storm would be and, and exactly where it would come ashore. And even some of the, the professional models were widely divergent. So most of the evacuation concerns were in the eastern, uh, the Tidewater region, where there is an increased risk of flooding and there was concern that the storm would be particularly intense. We began uh, right away working with the local governments, with the media, with the public uh, to get them ready in case they did need to evacuate uh, ahead of a Category 3 storm. I was looking for uh, lots of flooding, lots of trees down, widespread power outage, which obviously always um, has the propensity to have public safety issues beyond just the, the obvious storm factors. You, you have crime and other types of things that, that obviously rose in my mind. Our agency was looking at evacuation plans. The governor had declared a state of emergency. With 1.6 million people uh, having to move out of harm's way in a very short period of time, we think we're ready to do that. We can reverse lanes on the interstates. And if the public responds as they need to, uh, then we can keep everybody safe. Uh, that's the challenge, though, is to make sure we get that information out and convince people uh, that this is the time that they need to evacuate. My role with the EOC was related to my work with the Virginia Fusion Center. We had been working on doing um, public safety and national security analysis and support for them, and the EOC is, is part of the Fusion Center, so they were aware of our capabilities, particularly in terms of imagery. So when the storm started um, coming up the eastern seaboard, that's when they reached out to us and asked if we could assist. The Friday before the hurricane, I asked uh, Dr. McHugh if, we, uh, if they would consider using this type of imagery, the post-hurricane uh, imagery, to help us in mitigation efforts. I thought it would be too expensive and something that, would, that they would not want to undertake. And within a matter of hours, they came back and said, yes, we'll do it. And it was much to my surprise. Uh, and I thought this could uh, be very, very good and obviously a very, very good trial run for once again, 
uh, having uh, the horizontal and vertical type of connections that we have in the Virginia Fusion Center and dealing with a, a public safety event like Hurricane Irene and using a private public partnership in order to uh, to address it uh, I think is, is very important for emergency managers and, and actually government to look at. I think it was in March of last year uh, 2011 that we had the Japan earthquakes and they had uh, sent me some imagery from uh, the before and after shots of the earthquake and the tsunami uh, and to me that was very compelling and I thought that if Hurricane Irene was going to be that destructive that the before and after uh, in mitigation imagery would be a very useful tool uh, had Irene been more catastrophic than it was. The use of the, the imagery rolled out actually very, very quickly. The Fusion Center was aware of our ability to get imagery very quickly and very accurately. And the, the morning, the day before the storm, we got a, a call from the, ca uh, the director, Captain Lambert, of the Fusion Center and said, hey, you know, I understand that you collect imagery. As we're preparing for the storm, we understand that you've been able to use this in other natural disasters. Would it be possible for us to also have access to the capability? I quickly made a call to Jim Stokes, who was um, in our senior leadership at GOI. He then called Matt O'Connell, our, our CEO, and caught him literally as he was walking into a board of directors meeting, said, no, this is important. I need you to stand down for a minute and, and answer this and explain the situation. And Matt immediately said, absolutely, whatever you need, we'll make it happen. Go forward, do good, help the Commonwealth. So within a matter of hours, we were able to secure approval, get the training, deploy the resource, and the folks here at the Fusion Center were good to go. And this was literally in the day before the hurricane was set to, uh, to make landfall, we were able to um, put the request up, return a response, get the capability available to them and train them on it. It, it all played out within a matter of hours. If our technology had required weeks or even days of training, this would not have happened. We literally did the training over the phone in about 10 or 15 minutes, and that's what enabled them to be able to use it so quickly and so effectively. We were going to have an opportunity with this geospatial analytical component, with satellite imagery, to have a large-scale detection mechanism to determine where we need to station or direct mitigation efforts. Our platform su supports uh, situational awareness and, and the ground truth by giving accurate and reliable imagery very quickly. So we were able to, we had archival imagery that we were able to make available, set up a project folder for the folks here at the Fusion Center. Then we were able to capture in the, the days before the hurricane came through some last minute imagery for comparison and contrast purposes. And then as soon as the storm came through and the cloud cover was gone, we were able to go up and start capturing imagery almost immediately after the storm passed through. And then to be able to incorporate that with um, social media, YouTube images, you then get a comprehensive understanding of the damage and what the situation is like on the ground. I, d I definitely believe that, that geospatial analytics and, and geospatial imagery, particularly of large-scale events, it will be very, very useful uh, to help us mitigate response efforts. Uh, there's, there's probably no better way to get on one page or one um, uh, common operating picture uh, what the problems are and, and obviously get the, the folks that are in the response and recovery business to look at it and, and to, to call into uh, question what we should be addressing first. There was an incident with the Blackwater River which feeds into uh, Emporia which is notorious for being flooded during a, a lot of rain events. So the readings downstream at the Blackwater River were much lower than anticipated. Uh, there was a concern that there was some type of blockage upstream that, um, that uh, if it were to burst, would obviously send a deluge of uh, floodwaters down to, to Emporia. So we were concerned about that. They were able to give us those collection requirements. We were able to retask very quickly, and within about 24 hours, we were able to get them the imagery that they needed to make their decisions. The satellite imagery, especially of the Blackwater area, uh, was especially useful because it gave us that current real-time picture of what the situation was. Um, now we, at the same time, we were getting uh, information back from uh, VDOT and state police and those folks on the ground and from local responders 
but being able to pull up a picture and confirm the information we were getting, which is often conflicting information, um, that satellite imagery goes a long way toward being able to confirm that information and make a decision on what's the best uh, response immediately. Welcome back. Just a reminder to our viewers, you can find more information about this program by emailing your questions or your comments to questions at missioncriticaltv.com. And joining us now is Jim Stokes. Jim is the Deputy General Manager for GOI Analytics. Jim is a GIS and remote sensing engineer with 14 years of diverse analytical and technical experience. I want to continue our discussion about information technology standards and functions. Captain Lambert, let me start with you. It seems like we're in the midst of a technology boom. In the case study, we learned that your EOC was able to utilize new technology from the private sector to aid in your response. How did you identify that there was even a need for this technology prior to the storm? Well, uh, I knew that we had means of looking at uh, disaster, the disasters after they occurred through our Civil Air Patrol and a number of other uh, means. However, in this case, uh, what uh, struck me was after in March of 2011, the J Japan earthquake and tsunami that hit Fukushima in particular, I remembered seeing uh, some large-scale change detection GIS imagery uh, that one of our in-house partners in the Fusion Center uh, had sent me that gave a, a very vivid uh, visual description of the landscape before and after the tsunami. Uh, given what uh, Irene was looking to be as it churned up the coast to North Carolina, Virginia, I thought this might be useful. So that's how it came to be. They were in-house partners that I was familiar with. I see. Jim, weren't you the person that initially received that call? Yes, I was. Uh, we were already working with the Virginia Fusion Center as Steve said, related to some predictive analytic capability. And as a result of that geospatial technology leveraging imagery as a part of its capability, we had that as a, as a backup capability. And Mr. Lambert knew about that. Um, he made the call mostly out of seeing if it could possibly be available. And we were like, sure, we'll, we'll jump on this. So, big thing for us having a disaster <coughs> capability within the company was to make sure that for this event we had appropriate top cover. So my first call was to our CEO so that we could make sure that we had the right people in place to ensure delivery and collection post the event. So we were able to set that up in such a way through a, a web enabled system that the folks at the Fusion Center were able to capture that information as it was actually collected and processed through the system for them as quickly as possible. An amazing story. Captain Lambert, how, how did the use of, of this imaging technology actually support your mission demands? I understand that it was all pulled together uh, into the Virginia EOC plan only days before the hurricane came ashore, is that right? Uh, yes, Th there was obviously a flurry of activity. Uh, a few years before we had Hurricane Isabel, and it was a weak Category 1. This was predicted to be a 2 or 3, and uh, we were getting ready as a state to, uh, the governor declared a state of emergency uh, the day before. Mm -hmm. So there are a certain number of dynamics that go into play there to, to help, help that work. When, when I thought about, um, obviously, the fact that we might have a significant amount of damage requiring days of mitigation and a systematic approach to dealing with uh, more, you know, with, with higher priority problems. Um, I immediately just, I thought about GOI, I thought about the, um, the fact that uh, this might be helpful uh, to help those efforts. I offered it up to the EOC uh, after, uh, of course, getting the uh, go ahead from uh, Mr. Stokes and, and of course the folks there at GOI. Steve, I understand that this type of technology, the geospatial imaging, was really helpful to EOCs uh, during the Joplin uh, tornadoes and the earthquake that, that struck uh, Haiti. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. We use geospatial uh, uh, technology for just about every major disaster or large-scale incident. Mm -hmm. We have geospatial analysts stationed uh, full-time at the 
DHS National Operations Center, at the National Infrastructure Coordinating Center, uh, throughout the department, uh, and, and actually we rely extensively on the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, or NGA. Mm -hmm. They have a team of geospatial analysts that will deploy during a disaster to help uh, local first responders uh, better understand w what area has been impacted, not just by word of mouth, but actually being able to, to, to view it um, through geospatial technology. Uh, Captain Lambert mentioned the use of the Civil Air Patrol, fantastic resource, uh, very high quality imagery uh, from low flying, low altitude uh, uh, aircraft, um, gets great images uh, for use uh, and, and no security concerns because uh, frankly these are typically just photographs out of a, a Cessna, so it's sure. terrific uh, to be able to get that imagery, to be able to use it. and to have the smart folks there to make good use of it, uh, to be able to do some of the change analysis uh, and, and the other techniques that folks like uh, GOI provide. I see. Jim, I, I know that the, the satellite has various different spectrums to it. How do those capabilities help emergency managers do their job? Sure, there's a lot of different aspects that come into the technical components of, of imaging systems that uh, are extremely helpful. Um, one of the things that first comes to mind is the fact that uh, even during an event, we may be able to use some sort of radar uh, imagery to collect through the clouds because most electro-optical imagery requires that you see directly line of sight and not have any obscurant or obstruction. We have partner companies that have uh, synthetic aperture radar that uh, allows us to be able to see through the cloud. And for Irene, we actually collected during the event uh, in the Virginia Hampton Roads area, and we had imagery working through our IQ system, which is a kind of a data agnostic, standards-based uh, distribution capability for multi-source data, such that the EOC could also get to that data as well. So um, the other piece is certainly the change detection. So being able to see in a broad area where I've gone from what might be the state of normal to the state of serious disruption. Um, so that might go as detailed down to the roads where we could see power lines or bridges or other thing, uh. or large scale flooding, which was the case in Virginia where uh, we exceeded in a certain area what would be some of the projected models, per se, related to where the flooding would go. Uh, the best thing about the imagery, certainly, is it's the ground truth. Um, the other piece is uh, looking at imagery that can provide to us a, a look and understanding of infrared related to chlorophyll, so we can see vegetation damage or other things like that. So there's a long line of varying the capability that we can use technically to help uh, right after the event, but mm -hmm. potentially many weeks from a recovery standpoint. And it's been extremely useful across many domains from a response and recovery standpoint. I see. Captain Lambert, can you see this GIS imaging capability being beneficial for future disaster response? Absolutely. Uh, the only thing I would do different in this circumstance is maybe give uh, them a little more head time uh, and to, to get it ready. Uh -huh. uh, you have a, a training aspect that we dealt with, but um, in order to get them familiar and comfortable with the tool, but we, we are obviously building off of that. We are hopefully making that a capability that we're going to sustain in the Fusion Center or the Emergency Operations Center for future uh, disasters. I, I believe it will be beneficial for, uh, for years to come. Steve, from the federal perspective, what are some of today's more pressing operational needs and has technology really helped meet those? Well, I think situational awareness is probably the, the greatest need, okay. uh, technologically speaking, and there certainly are technological solutions to that. We, we've talked about one, uh, geospatial information systems, GIS, right. provides a tremendous ability to see uh, a, a large swath of the country and to understand better what, uh, what are the impacts of the disaster. Um, information sharing is so important. Uh, all too often, though, people are sharing information either one-on-one, -on -one, verbally, or when I go to emergency operations centers around the country, email seems to be a very popular way of sharing information. Well, well that's great. It's, 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 
it certainly serves its purposes. But if you want to share that information across all of the decision makers uh, and, and to everybody who has a real stake in this disaster, you need to move to something more like a, a common operating picture. And so I see a lot of advances in technology when it comes to providing that, that, uh, that common operating picture. Uh, for example, on the Homeland Security Information Network, or HISN, that the Department of Homeland Security offers, uh, there is a, a geospatial viewer called OneView that's available uh, for folks, and they can get a sense of uh, what's out there, what's happening, and, and what do we know. And being able to move from just a geospatial viewer to a true common operating picture uh, across the Homeland Security enterprise, and by that I mean all the responders uh, and all the emergency managers at the federal level, state, local levels, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to share that, have that common view to work towards the same endpoint, the same objective, I think is tremendously important. Well, uh, Captain Lambert, how do you determine what technologies will be used for each disaster on a local level? Well, it, it helps if, if it can be predicted, like a hurricane. Uh, obviously, it will change with uh, uh, tornadoes or a dam break or some other type of incident. Uh, but strategic planning helps that. In other words, when, uh, when, when we have a, an event that cannot be predicted, uh, some type of terror event or, or what have you, uh, we already have in place uh, a protocol with regard to we follow and what technologies we will employ to help mitigate that. Fusion centers are uh, first and foremost uh, important to help share the accurate and timely information uh, to the decision makers. And as you know, as things break and a number of folks are trying to get involved in the information sharing about any situation, there's a lot of stuff that's not actually true. And half of our job, or if not more, is wading through what is ground truth and what is not ground truth right. and getting it to the right folks. So that is where we focus on and, that, and the types of technologies that we will employ will most likely be what can give us ground truth. And a lot of times that's human resources, but mm -hmm. geospatial imagery does not lie. It gives you the ground truth. Yeah, this is especially important immediately after a disaster. When folks are surprised, nobody really knows what's going on. Uh, so we, we look to GIS certainly as a solution. Uh, and, and I think geospatial technology also offers a potential pitfall, at least to some of the research that I've been doing lately, has looked at the role of uh, models and simulations, which are fantastic in the absence of a disaster, but I think sometimes are relied on too heavily immediately following a disaster. Somebody sees a model and says, oh, well, this must be what's happening, as opposed to looking at the ground truth. Understanding what's real and what isn't, exactly as Captain Lambert said, is one of the most important and most difficult, challenging things to do immediately after a disaster. And if I can add, I think it all, it's, it's weaved through our conversation all day is the human element and the human processes and the MOUs and the human relationships that are obviously involved here are, uh, it's not technology, so to speak, but it is an integral part of the solution that we continually have to work on. You know, technology is great. GIS technology gives us the ground truth, but interpreting that is a human component um, and it will always be that way, I believe. Yeah, I really, really back that up tremendously. What we see is, uh, we like to say, people and machines, because the critical factor is interpreting and understanding. Technology can't be the one solution track. Um, we work in the predictive analytic domain. Um, it's not a crystal ball. It requires working mm -hmm. with the operator and the analyst and the technologist in this triangle of understanding how to take the intelligence plan for the mission and then work on operations. And that triangle right there is exactly embodied in making sure that we have SOPs that continue down the road not to rely on technology as a crutch or a single source, that we still do our job, which is the, the human factor. So I think it's a critical component of this discussion. Jim, you just mentioned the human factor as a significant variable, and that makes me think of another question in terms of processes. Uh, Steve, from a process standpoint, did, did the processes change in any way based upon the type of critical incident, whether it's a hurricane, a tornado, flooding, bombing, etc.? 
Well, if by process you mean the planning process specifically, I would say that there's a, a pretty consistent framework that's in place regardless of the hazard that you're looking at. So for example, uh, if I'm going to write plans and procedures for uh, a bombing in a jurisdiction, uh, I certainly would have to keep in mind that there are going to be, I mean, this is potentially a terrorist act, so I'm going to involve mm -hmm. federal law enforcement agencies responding. Um, it's fairly localized to that jurisdiction, although devastating, but uh, within a, generally within a confined area. Uh, counter that with, say, pandemic influenza. Oh, that's a, a huge uh, outbreak. There's really no one place for that. Um, it may not involve federal law enforcement response, not, certainly not nearly to the same extent, but might now involve public health. Uh, these are entirely different players uh, involved in this, in responding and mitigating this sort of uh, disaster. The planning process, though, remains consistent for each of these types of hazards, but the response can look very different. I see. As we all know, we're always looking to identify technology-specific, mission-related operational needs in a variety of settings, and certainly hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, et cetera. How do the different settings actually impact operational protocol? Well, um, we talked about the advances in geospatial technology and imagery. For example, if there's a, a, a hurricane or a, a bad weather event of some sort in, in an area, it used to be that we couldn't get imagery for that area, um, but that's changed with advances in synthetic aperture radar. Uh, geospatial technology, though, isn't limited to images. Uh, for example, um, it's estimated that 70 to 80 percent of all information out there has some sort of location reference or can be referenced to some place on the Earth. That really ex opens the, the floodgates here in terms of information that can be geocoded, geolocated, and visualized geospatially. For example, if you wanted to see how is an area after a hurricane um, responding maybe financially, uh, if you wanted to see uh, are the businesses up and running, well, you could certainly go out and take a poll or try to survey that information. A picture wouldn't help very much, right. but you could take all of the credit card transactions or all of the ATM transactions in the aggregate form and view that information geospatially and have a sense of before the, the, uh, the hurricane or earthquake came uh, occurred, uh, here's the level of activity in terms of number of transactions per day per location. And then after the earthquake or hurricane, you could look at that and see, well, how close are we to normal? Are we about 50% of the way there? Is there some area geographically that's more impacted than others when it comes to these credit card transactions? Now, this is a, a bit of a stretch, but it's, it's something that's not just photos. And I think it's important for, for people to realize that GIS is not just about pictures. So it's an ongoing feedback system then? Absolutely, with what's all going on in society. Exactly right, and you can. Uh, your imagination is the the only limit here. It doesn't have to be credit card transactions or ATM transactions. It doesn't have to be photographs. It could be all sorts of things. It could be the number of cell phones that just happen to be in the area and and on or being used. That sort of thing. That, that raises a point, Jim. From an engineering standpoint, does that really? How does that impact your your perspective of what's going on and how the product evolves? Sure. I, th I think I couldn't have said it any better myself with respect to the use of the technology um, all-encompassing. It's not just about the image. Um, and a lot of times we can't get the image. Um, the, the satellite systems may be obscured or um, specifically uh, tasked to do something on a higher priority. There may be other issues going on, so at that location we can't get the shot that we're looking for. So geospatial information in a standards-based construct can allow us to be able to see and understand and have better, better insight, uh, not just having the image. So we can look at social media, for example. Um, people can be putting out information related to how they're uh, recovering specifically to an event across the social media, and that can give us key indicator as well. So GIS as an information system, so geographic information system, includes imagery, but it also includes lots of other position location information about a broad, vast amount of data that we are actually consuming so much of it today, we really don't even know what to do with all of it. One of the best things that's available to us 
at, at just a baseline is to be able to put it in a location and time. So position, location, and time binning of information is critical when you're overwhelmed in an event. Where is that happening? Well, that's not happening in an area that I'm most concerned about. We're going to triage it so we can triage data with respect to events also. So the use of all this technology will be tremendous in terms of how we can apply it. The key is getting a handle on standards and data constructs that can manage it. That really raises in my mind too the, the whole issue about operational standards. Uh, this may vary among agencies, but who develops and justifies the operational requirements to meet mission demand? Well, I think w what we see is uh, from an industry perspective, because we have a lens across uh, Department of Defense domestic, but also ministries of defense um, uh, abroad, uh, domestic law enforcement from a federal all the way down to a local. So we've seen a tremendous amount of, uh, t let's say, types of data and SOPs for handling data. There are standards that exist today that really are coming in through the back door from a technology standpoint that I think are helping a lot uh, to accelerate the way systems are interoperable versus the politics or bureaucracy that's in, in the way in a lot of ways to get uh, data and other standards in place. So technology is outpacing policy and it's helping to enable capabilities to work together fairly seamlessly because the interesting thing is technologists want to be able to innovate. And the only way they can innovate is when they say, well, I can stitch this capability with this capability with this capability. And they communicate on all these blogs and uh, developer sites will make your tool work like this and I can do this. Mm -hmm. So again, the information age and technology age is certainly outpacing our ability to create policy. But I think that's a great thing because we are going to have a, a better standards world and we're seeing it more and more as time goes on. I've seen it change tremendously just in the past five years with respect to geospatial data and I think from a, a technology standpoint it's happening all across the globe frankly. So as I see it then technology is really a tool but when we're working in the emergency response area we really need to need the proper tools to effectively do the job. So. How does the, the response plan really all come together when we're dealing with that kind of change? Steve? Well, I, I think uh, in one word, uh, HSEEP. Okay, it's an acronym, so I, I'm cheating a little bit, but the Homeland Security Exercise and you Evaluation Program. federal guys love program. acronyms. We do, and I apologize for that. Uh, but HSEEP is a fantastic initiative uh, because if you, there was a, a report, I'll back up a little. After Hurricane Katrina, the U.S. Congress wrote a report and tried to evaluate what are some of the major problems, things that we can actually solve, and that's what matters, not who to blame, but um, what are the solutions that we can make sure that we implement in our communities uh, all around the country? Now, one of the concerns that was raised in that report was uh, that there were great plans that sat on some shelves and weren't implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, not an across the board uh, condemnation, but I hope that that's never written about you know, my community, my department, et cetera, moving forward. And I think we can all take a lesson from this by exercising, uh, training on the plan, evaluating the plans more thoroughly. All of that is where it really matters. It does none of us any good to have a terrific, well-written plan that nobody reads, that we don't actually follow the procedures and, and protocols that might be uh, right. documented there. We've right. got to train on them. We've got to train our folks on how to, uh, on the plans that are there. If the training shows that uh, these plans really aren't going to work or more likely an exercise that we conduct shows that the plan isn't viable, let's change the plan. But it really is a cycle in terms of um, writing a great plan, uh, training on it, performing drills, uh, then exercising the plan, and all every step away through making changes to the plan to make sure that it's the best plan it can be and that we're actually going to implement that plan when or 
if the time ever comes. So that last part is what really intrigues me is that there's this constant analysis of the plan itself and always looking to see whether we need course corrections. Absolutely, a feedback loop. And everyone in the department or agency is responsible for this. Okay. If you are a, a, you know, a, a junior firefighter or a, a new police recruit, and you're in an, involved in an exercise, and this just doesn't isn't going to work. Um, and you see problems. It's important to raise those issues up to make sure that the the highest appropriate levels uh, of management are aware of this and are able to make changes to the plan. Because the plan is only good um, if we're actually going to implement it and to use it, and it, and it actually meets our needs. Excellent. I want to thank each of you for joining us on the show today and sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us. My sincere thanks. Join us on Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Mission Critical TV. We would like to know if you found the program helpful. Is there a training topic you would like us to cover? You can also share with us important news from your region and learn how to receive credit for this training program. I want emergency managers to know that these capabilities are available and this was a great example of what can happen when you reach out and ask and you have these public-private partnerships and we work together to change outcomes. Be open-minded. Uh, a lot of times something that uh, at first blush doesn't look as if it's going to have a, a great impact really can turn out to be so, uh, a precious tool, something that you just didn't anticipate. So keep an open mind, um, reach out to your private and public sector partners, um, and especially be aware that there are, are things happening, changes happening, especially in the world of technology uh, every day that can enhance our posture and make for a better response and recovery. What I'd like people to, to know about this incident was here we had a fusion center who was able to, based on uh, a, a private, part, a public-private partnership in the Fusion Center, to leverage uh, multi-million dollar satellites and satellite technology to address a purely um, public, public safety issue. And to me, that's, that's pretty neat. We were able to do that pretty quickly, and we were able to do that in a way that we learned a great deal uh, from, how, uh, from what happened and how we're going to deploy it in the future. This was just one of those great days to, to be working in this field. I, I thoroughly enjoy what I do and the opportunity to come in to help um, anticipate, mitigate, respond more effectively and change outcomes is what keeps me coming back. This was just one of those great things where everyone jumped in, everyone worked together, all the right decisions were made things were deployed in a timely manner, the storm wasn't as serious as we thought it would be, and the outcomes were great. Obviously, I've, I've been at this for a long time, over 40 years now, and I think really what, what keeps you going is the fact that if you can do your job well, you're going to save lives, you're going to help people recover from that disaster more quickly than they might otherwise. Um, it's, it's the thing I think that makes everybody involved in emergency management uh, stick with it. It's, it's, sometimes it's a tough job, but it is, it is extremely rewarding. And the real key is being prepared so that you can respond properly and help make things easier for people. Welcome back. We have a new guest joining us, Mr. Frank Kitsero. Frank is the police chief for the town of Jupiter, Florida, as well as the director for LEX, Law Enforcement Exchange. He's also a former major with the Fairfax County Police. Gentlemen, I want to begin by asking Frank about the initiative he is spearheading to improve public safety communications. I understand there's been some important strides made to improve interoperability. Is that right, Frank? That is, John. Uh, actually, through our LEX program, our data sharing program, uh, we're now in a position where all of the law enforcement agencies here in Palm Beach County, which are nearly 30 agencies, are now all linked together and sharing information on a daily basis. And uh, it really empowers some of our smaller jurisdictions, but also provides opportunities for uh, the larger ones as well to uh, investigate crimes, enhance uh, quality of life, but more importantly, 
we're working together on a day-to-day -day basis so that when the time comes, and I'm not saying if, when the time comes, that we get into the disaster preparedness and we have to cross jurisdictional boundaries and do the things that you all have been talking about this morning, we're better prepared because we're used to working with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And these are both large and small agencies that are all working together, correct? Correct, large and small agencies. And, uh, and we actually have, we're very successful at getting <coughs> over the hurdles of having everybody agreeing to work together together and sharing information and sharing data because it's great to have all the technology as you all have been talking about here previously but uh, the technology doesn't drive the bus it's the people that drive the bus and when you can get everybody working together and in, in the same direction going in the same direction it really um, it really helps get us ready for when those big events occur it, it almost sounds like it's a paradigm shift, Frank, uh, in terms of getting all of these agencies working together. Has that been your experience? It is. It is a paradigm shift. You know, we're moving away from, you know, this is our agency, this is what we're responsible for, even staying within your jurisdictional boundaries. You know, criminals, terrorists, they, they don't know jurisdictional boundaries, and we've been a little bit behind the eight ball on that, and now we're finally waking up and, and recognizing that we need to be working together. We need to uh, use the resources to eliminate those boundaries, and not only you know, for to make ourselves better, but I think it's really what the public expects from us. Exactly. Steve, from the federal perspective, mm -hmm. are there other communities in the United States that are trying similar approaches? Well, not too many. It's pretty innovative, and it's a great thing to see. I know Missouri has the Molex, and uh, Texas has their uh, Telex. Um, so there are some out there, but, um, but this is a, a terrific model, I think, for a lot of other departments and agencies to consider. I see. Captain Lambert, uh, you're right outside the nation's capital, and how are, how are the interoperability issues being dealt with there uh, on your level? Uh, to, to just springboard right off what the chief was saying, uh, and of course he was involved in <clears throat> what we have in the national capital region is called the Council of Governments. And uh, they are not just administrators, if you will, uh, of how things evolve, but they're very aggressive. I, the chief is right on target with what we're seeing is there is a great demand from the public and then hence our public safety officers to do something, to address problems, to, to be out in front of the curve or to the left of the event. Mm -hmm. uh, so those, those types of arrangements, the information sharing capabilities that have become dramatically greater since 9-11 uh, are all a result of uh, groups like the Council of State Governments or the Council, I'm sorry, the Council of Governments right out of Washington, D.C., uh, looking at problems and collectively from the Baltimore all around the National Capital Region, folks that we did not know before, interact with before, working uh, together to solve certain problems. I see. I really want to learn from all of you uh, about how technology is evaluated and then acquired in the crisis and response environment. Uh, Frank, how are the communications technologies in your new system vetted? Well, that, that's really a very good question because you have to remember that uh, in, in our particular case, we're dealing with disparate systems. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not all on the same say uh, records management system, for example. So our technology uh, uh, initiatives are centered around being able to link those things together, mm -hmm. uh, if you will. So the vetting process for that takes place at both an organizational level from Lex, but also has to be a partnership with the uh, with the individual organization or agency. Because in essence, we're we're saying, look, we want to make this link from your records management system to our Lex organization, and we want to use X technology. Are you agreeable to that? And so there's a lot of give and take there. Captain Lambert, you've been at the Fusion Center since day one. Um, how were those systems acquired? Well, we're still operating on some legacy systems that are currently, as we sit, being uh, replaced. Okay. Uh, so the requirements for, you know, because Fusion Centers have evolved. I don't think anyone would argue with me. They have evolved from focusing on crime or terrorism to now all crimes, all hazards. So you you still have this issue of federated search, which we've talked about today, uh, which is really uh, more becoming standard for fusion centers and dealing with desperate systems or legacy systems and making sure that they talk to one another and are able to be 
uh, of use. Um, the, the biggest thing that we're seeing in the, in the fusion center with regard to, to uh, <coughs> vetting it or, or evaluating it is, does it fit into our mission and the protocols that we have currently? If it's something that, uh, for the lack of a better word, that's clunky, that, that has to try to fit into our business process, it generally doesn't go well, and therefore it doesn't succeed. So we're, it, it is a, that is the evaluation process of different uh, missions that are asked of fusion centers because they are becoming more of a mission-centric uh, focus for a lot of organizations that we haven't there, uh, in the four, like health or uh, the, the uh, different critical infrastructure sectors of, um, you know, like power. Uh, working those folks in and how we integrate uh, or leverage the information that they have and the systems that they have in order to uh, address specific mission goals. It, it sounds challenging, but yet one of the challenges that may be the uh, elephant in the room that sometimes we don't talk about is our budget restrictions. Yeah. Have budget restrictions had any impact on how your fusion center systems were really acquired? Yes, and uh, uh, very much so. Uh, and, and, and fusion centers across the country are, are a little different in, in, in a number of ways. One, uh, particularly for us, is our fusion center is probably 90 to 95 percent state funded. We rely very little on federal grants. So um, it hasn't impacted us with regard to the, the federal grants diminishing. But obviously, the state of Virginia, like everyone else across the United States, had budgetary problems during the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. So we continue to plot on with what we have, making the best and trying to streamline process as opposed to technology until we have time or money to, uh, to address <coughs> technological issues that can be corrected by throwing money at it, uh, for the lack of a better term. So it, it's, it's had a, an adra a dramatic effect on our ability to, to address certain things, certain problems, but it is, um, we haven't obviously been ineffective because of the human processes and what we've been using in, in lieu of a new technological solution. So it's doing more with less? In that's, many ways. I, I believe that's uh, <laughs> most of what government does anyway. That's true. Frank, uh, that raises the question, here you are in, in Florida dealing with uh, it's been no secret in the press that there's been budget issues in Florida. Same question for you. How were, uh, how did the budget impact your ability to get this new Lex idea off the ground? Well, no doubt it has had an impact. We've kind of taken a unique approach from the Lex perspective. We actually work to make ourselves as an organization a 501c3 mm -hmm. so that we can leverage opportunities with the business community and, uh, and other folks that are involved in, in this type of uh, work. Uh, to the extent that right now we're evaluating a new platform uh, f to take Lex to the next level, and uh, and in doing so, we've had quite a, a few, uh, quite a bit of interest from some vendors who are interested in also participating um, to the so that they could kind of use Lex as a model. So we're looking to leverage the public-private partnership. Now there is a certain amount of funding that each jurisdiction. Um, provides to Lex, and it's based on the number of officers within the department, um, but it's really minimal in comparison to the other budget obligations. The challenge you have with, with um, programs like these, especially in tight budget times, is making them the priority. Mm -hmm. So that when people put their budgets together, we want them to look at Lex as one of those programs that just can't be cut. The 501c3 uh, idea seems unique, which raises the question for me, have you written anything up or has anything been put into LLIS, the Lessons Learned Information System? No, we haven't used that specific resource, but I can tell you that as the uh, chairman for the group, I get calls regularly and sure. emails, and so we, we kind of share it on a case-by-case -case basis, but certainly it is a resource that I think uh, would be worth looking looking into because we as, a, as a law enforcement, we as a, a homeland and, and the entire group responsible for protecting our country really need to keep these types of um, initiatives on the forefront and, and keep them from getting cut because yeah, we're, we're, the sustainability is huge right, as the absolutely. captain just talked about. And we're not in it alone. We're we really not. aren't. But nothing uh, brings uh, 
a technology or process to the forefront like success. And when you have success with something Good point. like Lex or Lynx, uh, which has been highly successful in solving what our mission uh, issues are, uh, it certainly helps when budgetary talks come around. With the national economy trying to really establish its footing still after all these years, how do we overcome the economic challenges? I, I think I think we're on the way to doing that. I think we have to get out of the mindset that the federal, state, or local government is going to pay for everything. Mm -hmm. And we have to develop those public-private partnerships. And I think that's going to be the key to long-term sustainability because I don't think anybody's really sure what the new normal is going to be in terms of you know, f financing or fiscal responsibility in the future or government budgets or, I mean, we're in such a, uh, a flux right now that it's, we're not sure what it's going to be in the future. So I think that's even, I think that lends more credibility to the public-private partnership um, theory or, or um, initiatives. You, you use a great term, the new normal. How do we educate our legislators about the new normal so that they might be more responsive and not look at this as a cost center, but look at it more as an investment in genuine public safety in the future. Captain Lambert? Well, I, I think you're also seeing um, another kind of a paradigm shift where law enforcement is becoming more aggressive in dealing with legislatures and, and obviously governing bodies. Right. Uh, you know, th there was an old adage uh, years ago in law enforcement, if you didn't own it, you don't control it. Uh, in other words, when you need it, uh, you may find that whoever owns it needs it more or wants it. Well, with the mutual aid agreements and the, and the, the new normal, as the chief had, has explained, that's no longer the case. You're getting more and more uh, folks who obviously see that the solutions to our problems are very expensive. And uh, in order to reach out and, and to help the, uh, our legislators know, to help our uh, police chiefs know that you know, we, we can't afford many of the very expensive technological solutions to address the problems you're wanting us to address. So this private partner type relationship and this new normal is what we need to get on board with. Um, and obviously, I, I would encourage uh, chiefs uh, and other uh, fire service, whomever in, in public safety, to help them to understand that. I, I do think that is the next gen of public response. Steve? You know, I also think something that is frequently forgotten about is that when we want to influence the decisions that are made on the legislature, uh, a lot of that is just information, getting them to understand what is it that we do. We take for granted, I think, very often we take for granted um, our own actions, our own needs, uh, and our organization. What happens? Uh, as if everybody understands that and everybody sees it. Well, a lot of times people don't, and folks who are elected members uh, to the legislatures at the state level or uh, or even the federal level uh, don't necessarily understand what it is that uh, happens in a fusion center. Uh, I certainly uh, was fortunate enough to have uh, members of Congress come out to an operations center that I was responsible for, uh, take a tour and, and, and ask some tough questions. Uh, if you're doing the right thing and your program really is valuable, as we saw with Lex, then you have nothing to fear. And it's actually a great idea, I think, to try to invite these decision makers to come out and learn more about what are you doing and how are you better protecting the citizens? Here's, I think here's one of the challenges we have. And the more we work together, the more we do the things we're doing, the more we prevent. The more we prevent, hmm. the less we are at the uh, scene at the forefront because it's hard to measure what you prevent. Right. So when it comes time for budgets and elected officials um, are looking at budgets because, not any, because we're doing such a good job, they're not seeing all the behind the scenes work, they're not seeing all the need for all the resources. You know, think about whenever a, a natural disaster or something strikes. Everybody rallies around mm -hmm. and everybody chips in, budgets, contributions, but it's not too long after that event that memories fade and those folks that are experienced the disaster are still left dealing with the thing you're talking about which is recovery right and I, in my mind having done this for a number of years i think we're no different you know if we have something that is at the forefront everybody pays attention you let it go to by the wayside or to the fact that we don't have anything in the news 
because we're all doing such a good job, guess what? We're not on the radar anymore, and there goes the funding. Gentlemen, I know there are some vulnerabilities in the technology area that we depend upon for critical incidents. Uh, from each of your individual perspectives, what is the single most outdated technology we all need to really start to look at? And Steve, if we can start with you. Honestly, I think um, outdated technology is the greatest vulnerability. Uh, what I mean by that is, in, uh, in 1968 in Alabama, that was uh, the, the first use of the 911 uh, phone number to call and, and report an emergency. Now, there was no automatic uh, address or anything like that that came with it. You simply knew what number to call no matter where you were in that area. Obviously, that's taken off. And in mm -hmm. the mid-70s, we finally saw uh, the, the billing address for the telephone, registered to the telephone number, provided to that call center. Um, part of the Annie Alley system, in that case, the uh, Automatic Location Information, or ALI Alley. Uh, terrific, if, as long as you have landline phones. Sometimes you have mistakes where someone else is paying maybe for the phone right. service in a different location, but that was updated. So uh, yet again, we have another technological advancement where we say, well, let's, let's make these changes to the system so we have a more accurate database, if you will. Mm -hmm. Then we saw folks buying and using mobile phones. Well, there's billing addresses irrelevant. If I'm on my mobile phone, I'm quite possibly not at home wherever the bill comes. Uh, not to mention the fact I probably pay that online anyway. Uh, but now we have to make changes, and we are making changes to keep up with that. But departments that refuse to stay abreast of the latest technological changes are going to be left behind, and they're going to fail to serve their, their citizens, their customers, if you will. Uh, and that, I think, is the biggest problem that we, the biggest vulnerability and biggest challenge that we face in, in all fields, not just 911 phone calls, but across uh, all of the public safety uh, enterprise. Hmm. Interesting. Frank, your perspective? I think, um, from my perspective, what I see coming down the road, I wouldn't pick any one piece of technology. What I would really focus on are those uh, uh, technology issues where the systems are proprietary with no possibility of integrating in uh, with you know other agencies or other uh, avenues to to collaborate as we said before so you know to me I think I would really want to uh, focus on eliminating those uh, proprietary system not saying it's, it's a bad idea to have proprietary system but you have to have that type of system with the capability to expand later on if you so choose to do so Captain Lambert, how important are private sector relationships to your operation at the Fusion Center? Earlier, Steve mentioned that 80, 80 to 85 percent of all critical infrastructure are privately owned. Uh, we have, uh, they're very important. We, we obviously have um, involved ourselves with uh, certain uh, corporate groups such as InfraGuard, which is an FBI program. Mm -hmm. rather, rather than go out and try to, uh, uh, to reach out to all this private sector uh, folks that are inf in, uh, interested in sharing information with us, rather than reinventing the wheel, we, we obviously saw the FBI had a, a very good program uh, called InfraGuard. So we immediately uh, joined in with that and began um, attending meetings and meeting the different private sector folks. And this is all aside from the ones that I've mentioned earlier that are in-house at the Fusion Center. Mm -hmm. So um, it, is, it is something that we will continue to develop. It's something that we, we, we cannot fulfill our mission without private sector uh, relationships. So it will continue to be on the forefront of our frontier of evolution. Steve, from the DHS perspective, um, how do you think technology will impact, uh, say, preparedness? Well, uh, certainly we spoke about geospatial information systems and uh, in terms of preparedness, uh, I'm seeing fire departments use GIS to improve all of their pre-plans. Uh, in some cases, they'll do a hazard identification of every structure within their jurisdiction and identify places that are really no entry zones because they're maybe abandoned structures that are in partial collapse already. So they're mm -hmm. already unsafe uh, or uh, significantly high hazard structures. Uh, through the use of GIS, um, identifying those locations, getting that information to responding officers and firefighters right away is critically important and I think dramatically improves um, the response effort. And all of that is done uh, as a preparedness activity ahead of time before the disaster. Good point. Frank, 
How do you think technology will impact response and recovery? I think it's definitely going to impact that whole business. And, and, I, and I go back to what I said a while ago. It, um, actually, a couple of things. First of all, your response has to be coordinated. We're talking about eliminating jurisdictional boundaries virtually, and so that means we're all working together. That means we have to have the abilities to communicate and sustain that communication in an environment where we are post-disaster. And, uh, and that's why I, th I would go back to what I said a little while ago, is make sure you understand the limitations of it. Um, because if we all train in this and do things a certain way, and we're relying on that technology, and when you get into the arena, if you will, it doesn't work, it's gonna complicate the, the way you respond. And the reality of it is, from a, a frontline perspective, we're gonna to have to hold down the fort for a while until our state and federal partners can get there with the resources and, and the equipment and the help that we're gonna to need to carry on the mission. So I think it's extremely critical. You really raise a good point when you say getting the job done. And, and Captain Lambert, I, I wanna just follow back on something you said a little bit earlier. How does technology really impact uh, the whole aspect of mitigation? Does it have a beneficial impact? Oh, absolutely. I, I, you know, as, as we're talking, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind of a couple of situations we've had over the last couple of years uh -huh. where there were situations, an active shooter situation, where uh, we had a helicopter shot down, you know, that was obviously providing uh, situational awareness for us. Uh, multiple, uh, you know, uh, homicides at one point in time. Uh, police are very good at kicking in doors. We're not very good at urban search and warfare. That's generally a, uh, a military type exercise. So right. you have all this uh, training issues in the hot wash that we deal with. But what you're trying to do uh, with a situation like I'm describing is to retake control of the situation. Now, how do you do that? Intelligence is a great way to do that. Within a, within a few moments, uh, you're able to get to the folks on the ground who this guy is and why he may be doing what he's doing. And in order to, to deal with uh, the situation of he's in the woods and we can't find out where he is and we're trying to find out his location, mm -hmm. uh, there are certain technologies that we have found in the hot wash that are able to address that, to give the folks on the ground an idea of what the contours of the land are, what uh, you know, different methods that we might be to address that situation and retake control of the situation. Uh, so in mitigation, there are technologies out there that heretofore were, were not even in our lexicon or, or, or arena of ideas uh, that are, hey, that's a great way to do that. Now, does it fit in with what our protocols are and I we see. move from there? I see. Gentlemen, I'd really like to thank you for joining us today and taking the time to actively participate in this training. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Learn more about future Mission Critical programs at our website, missioncriticaltv.com. And to all of our viewers, thank you for joining us. Just as a reminder to our viewers, Capella University will have an archive of this program. And for those interested in receiving professional educational credits, you will need to log on to the Capella University site at capella.edu forward slash mission critical. At this Capella website, you can watch this episode again and register to earn professional credits.